Well, I'm Julian Bagini. I'm a writer and philosopher, essentially, uh, mostly working freelance. Lovely. And we're here at How the Light Gets In. Um, why do you think, if you do think, that ideas and big thinking are important today? Well, I mean, you know, there's always a problem, I think. Philosophers, look, you ask anyone what they do, they tend to exaggerate its importance. <laughs> you know, uh, philosophers, it's very easy for them to do that. You know, historically, we've had this privileged place in society as a you know, the sages and the gurus and the, the wise people. So actually, I'm always a bit wary about over-talking up philosophy's role. But actually, as a matter of fact, I think it is important. It's important not as a dispenser of wisdom and insight that the world needs to thankfully gobble up and say, oh, well done, now we understand the world better. But it's a kind of a dimension of the cultural conversation, which I think is often missing. Because now, wherever you look, whether we're having debates about national identity, technology, human enhancement, e equality, etc., cetera, et cetera, the environment, all these issues have vast philosophical assumptions and ideas behind them, which require unpicking and discussing. You know, you can't solve the climate crisis unless you have some sense of, you know, what's at stake, what matters, and how future generations uh, comparing their interests to present ones, et cetera, et cetera. So I just think that philosophy is often the unexamined aspect of a lot of big issues, but it's an important one. And do you think it should be like a sort of a duty for philosophers to talk about politics or to get involved with politics? Well, not necessarily politics. I, I think the, and I also would defend the right of some philosophers just to pursue their, their pure research. In any subject area, there are some corners of it which really, you know, they're only of interest directly to people in that field. And you don't know what's going to happen in the long run. That's the point. I mean, it may turn out to be useful for other people. It may not. But if you start off by saying, no, no, we're only going to support people who do things which are clearly relevant, I think the problem there is you're prejudging what relevant is and you're prejudging what, what might happen. So you need a broad canvas for sure. Having said that, though, I think that, yes, there is a kind of a responsibility, a kind of collective responsibility, if you like, for people engaging in philosophy to try and, you know, join up what they're thinking with those broader public debates. It's about, I think you say, participating in the broader cultural conversation. It's not about offering your, your wisdom in that way. Not necessarily politics, though. I mean, politics is one d dimension of it. Um, you know, uh, it's quite interesting. We have this thing now in Britain, which is called the Research Excellence Framework, which is a way in which university departments are judged according to the quality of their work and their funding depends on this. And it used to be just about research, and now we also assess for the impact on society. And since philosophers have been doing that, it's really interesting to look at these case studies they have to write to justify their work. And you have philosophers working in healthcare, working with, in, in the arts, working along historical archive projects, and so on. There are all sorts of ways in which philosophy joins up with culture. Politics is, is just one of them. Mm -hmm. And you've written more recently about the situation in Britain with Brexit and how philosophy can help in that sort of situation or with a more divided nation or... Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not quite sure how much philosophy can help. Sometimes you can diagnose a problem more easily than you can treat it, right? I, I think there are various issues around that Brexit are brought to the fore, which I think are deeply problematic. Um, just one is, I think, how we understand democracy, actually, because, you know, this whole Brexit debate, part of the toxicity of it is that there are a whole load of people claiming that the only democratic thing to do is to basically do what one referendum on one day said we should do. Now, the reason that's mistaken is not because the result was incorrect from the point of view of someone like me, who was a Remainer. Um, it was the wrong way of doing it anyway. Um, so democracy. The short answer to this is that democracy in its pure form was never a good idea, frankly. In that sense, call me an anti-democrat. When Plato and Aristotle criticised democracy, they were correct because what they were criticising was a system in which you basically ask the people what they think and majority opinion wins and that's the end of the debate. Obviously a stupid thing to do because people aren't necessarily informed enough to know the full situation, but also it creates division. It also means there's no long-term rule of law because what the people want today is what you must do. And if they want something different tomorrow, it's a recipe for chaos. Democ we made democracy work by not making it pure democracy. We had a system whereby government is accountable to the people, which means that we can kick them out 
if we don't like them, and we choose the ones we think are heading in the right general direction. And the whole point about successful democracies is that they are enablers to, to negotiate difference. That's the whole point. Referendums and pure democracy is actually about taking away the possibility of negotiating difference because basically the winner takes the spoils. So I think people have got to think hard about, you know, the failure of this process of Brexit has shown how it is utterly disastrous to think that democracy is about enacting the will of the majority at any given day. Democracy is about negotiating the different views of the population. That's what makes it work. But do you think it necessarily will lead to chaos? Getting democracy in the sort of Platonic or uh, ancient Greece? Yeah, I mean, chaos or tyranny or both. Probably tyranny actually, because um, it, that's a more likely outcome. Because if ever you have a situation, you know, government by the majority, the, 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 in political philosophy and political theory, people say they distinguish between democracy proper, as they call it, and majoritarianism. Majoritarianism is just the government of the majority over the minority, which leads to kind of oppression. It leads to the minority feeling disenfranchised. It can almost lead to them taking uh, their, their rights being taken away. Now, I, I think that that's nice to think that, that majoritarianism isn't really democracy. I think that's not true. I think majoritarianism is pure democracy, and what we want is something else. It's kind of inevitable. You know, I, I, if you take the theoretical objections to pure democracy, they, they stand up, I think. You know? uh, and I think it's quite evident that you look anywhere around the world where democracy has worked, it hasn't worked by empowering the majority to do what they want, irrespective of the interests of the minority. It's been a system in which there is an understanding, for a start, that whoever wins governs for all, not just the people who elected them. That's kind of going out the window, right? People, you know, now people are being expected to, you, 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 we've elected you as a Brexit person, you must speak for us and you sod the Remainers, and vice versa. I was elected on a Remain platform, so I'm not going to think about, about them. It's, it's inherently divisive, I think, to go for that pure form of democracy. But is that the system of democracy or humans? <laughs> well, look, humans are part of the system of democracy. Um, I don't think you can sort of distinguish them. It's, it's the humans to the extent that um, we have conflicting and different desires and preferences and values. It's a fact about human society that there is that kind of diversity. We're not going to all agree. And it's also perhaps um, something to do with human nature that generally speaking people are reluctant to compromise on what they think is most important to themselves. Okay, so the inbuilt human nature aspect of it is that there's a diversity of opinion and a kind of reluctance to compromise on that. Then the system aspect of it is, how does the system deal with it? And I think the problem with a, a democracy of the kind that majority wins and majority takes all is that it doesn't do anything to counter uh, those two problems. It doesn't help us to deal with a diversity of opinion. It doesn't help us deal with the fact that people are reluctant to give up their, their, their views or their positions. When democracy as, as it is works, it's precisely because having been elected, a government then seeks to do something which gives something to all sides. It gives more to the majority, sure, they won, but it gives something to the others as well. And it, and it manages that diversity of opinion. And can we look at any philosophical traditions to s get over these sort of barriers of either like reluctance to give up our own ideas or accept difference of opinions? Well, I think we can look to our own, I mean, I'm speaking as a, a Western European, we can look to our own traditions actually around that. I think we have a, a strong tradition of, uh, you know, the, the importance of reason debate and of argument. And there's quite a lot of you know, theoretical work which has been practically important about dealing with plurality of values and basic liberal ideas of liberty which allow difference. So there's a lot of resources within our own culture. But I think that it's also helpful to have that balanced a bit because I think that if there's a weakness in our culture, it's that it's become very individual focused. And we tend to always emphasize the rights and freedoms of the individual. And then always kind of assume that anything that sort of diminishes those, there's a very strong burden of proof on it. And it's somehow kind of bad or regrettable. I think if we look to some sort of non-Western traditions, if you look at say Confucian, ethics in, in China. Um, and also sort of, sort of everywhere in the Far East, to be honest. Uh, 
then what you really find is that there, there is more of an understanding of the self as being in, in, embedded in society. So who you are, yes, you have your individual value and dignity, but you can only really understand who you are as understanding yourself as someone who exists in social relations to others. And what that kind of way of thinking does is people think that's a kind of an anti-liberty and freedom position. It, it, it needn't be, and it doesn't have to be. But what it is, is it's just contextualizing individual freedom and liberty. And in a way, it's making explicit something which we already know. We already know that although we value individual freedom and liberty, we can't just do what we want um, if it harms others and so forth. But we, we tend to have a very limited, narrow definition of what that harm is, physically harming someone and so forth. If we look at cultures which have a more of a emphasis on the importance of social harmony and so forth, it sees that when, when we ourselves as it were, demand less of our own individual rights. That's not because we are just subsuming our identity to the whole or something, or, or create, for, going along with this collective. It's not about that. It's actually about a more honest recognition that for anyone to have their individual liberty, there needs to be a, a kind of a proper accommodation of, of everyone else's too. So a greater sort of other focus, I think, um, is something that we can glean a bit more from non-Western traditions. So the lessons you've taken from sort of non-Western traditions, such as like in your work, How the World Thinks, how do you think we can take them on board? Do you think that sort of the individualism in the West has gone too far, that we can sort of recognise different traditions? How, but how do we then incorporate it? Has it affected like yourself, like yeah, your own yeah, yeah. opinions or how you've led your life? Yeah, I mean, how, how you learn and incorporate from other traditions is an interesting one. I think one thing you have to recognise, well, a couple of things one has to recognise. One is that cultures are very complicated things. And there's a whole kind of ecosystem. There's a philosophical ecosystem and a value ecosystem. And you can never kind of like simply pluck out a value or an ideal from another culture and like plant it in your own soil and expect it to flourish in that way, you know, in the same way, you know, the horticultural analogy is quite good there. You know, if you just take someone from a different environment and put it in, either it won't grow or it might take over. Only, only very few plants actually, you know, fit in very well. So I think you've got to recognise the fact that we are where we are. We have a kind of, we have the culture we have and that's a product of our tradition and our history. And, and it'd be pointless to simply try and copy what anyone else in the world is doing, even if we thought it was the best system. But the more hopeful note is this. Whenever I talk about my book, I always end up using the same quote from a guy called Tom Kasulis, who's a fantastic comparative philosopher. And he says words to the effect of, if you want to understand cultural difference, including philosophical difference, don't think about binary opposites or either ors. Think rather that what's background in one culture is foreground in another and vice versa. So I use this kind of metaphor of a, like a a mixing desk or a graphic equaliser, if you like. The kind of thing we had on uh, old, st if you're a certain age, which, which you're not, you know, the old stereos had all the little dials, like the treble, the bass, whatever it might be. In a recording studio, you record all the instruments, each one has its channel, and when you're trying to create the final mix, you turn things up and down, depending on what you like the sound to be. Well, I think if you look around the world, the values list, if you like, political and ethical values list, it's kind of the same everywhere. The difference is, how far they're turned up and down. We've turned up things around individual liberty to 11, right? Um, in, in cultures like China, for example, social harmony is just turned up higher than us. It's, it's on our scale. Everyone values social harmony, but it's, it gets drowned out a lot of the time from individual liberty. So I think the best way to learn is this. You look at how other cultures do things differently and you don't therefore go away and try and copy it. But what you do is you go back and look at your own cultural dial and you say, well, okay, so Having made that comparison, have we got our settings right? Have we turned up individualism too much? If so, it's not about rejecting individualism, it's just sort of like dialing it down a bit. Are there other things we need to dial up? I think that's the way to learn. And it's, it's, um, it's tricky because there's no algorithm for this. People like algorithms, how should you live? What's the ideal society? The tradition of thought in the West has also had that model. And Marty Sen, I think, criticized it very, very well that the way we set about thinking about politics is we imagine the ideal society and then we try and get as close to it as possible. And I think Sen persuasively argues that's nonsense. You start from where you are and then you, you make your adjustments. That's the way to go. And making those adjustments is not about, requires judgment. And this is what I think philosophers are very uncomfortable with. 
a lot of people are uncomfortable with. You can't just say this is the right answer. You've just got to use your judgment about what the right level is. Uh, and in a democracy, of course, you use that judgment in a way you have to try and bring people along with you and persuade them. And so do you think that we can teach philosophy in a different way to make people feel empowered to be able to make those adjustments? Well, I think that obviously you won't be surprised to think that I think that philosophy should have a greater role in the education system. But in my ideal world, I wouldn't necessarily introduce philosophy as a separate subject. I, I think the greatest potential is for people to look at the philosophical dimension in all the subjects we already study. Because that has various advantages. First of all, it makes it more real and applicable straight away. You're not teaching this weird abstract subject and then having to make people see the relations between things. Rather, you know, you can talk about identity, character, personality through literature or something. You can understand, you know, uh, arguments about truth and objectivity through history and philosophy of science and so forth. So I, I, I would like to see that way of bringing philosophy into the education system. And I think if it, if we'd had that kind of system, sure, people would be more empowered to sort of um, see those philosophical uh, ways of thinking and to incorporate them more into their broader debate. Because I think it is missing from so many things. I mean, there's, there are philosophical dimensions to all sorts of important political and ethical debates, and they're often kind of just ignored. And from your work in How the World Thinks, how do you go about doing your own research? Like, how did you come to research different uh, yeah. cultures and their philosophy? Well, I mean, my, the way I work is, I'm, I'm not an academic, and the reason for that is that I'm, my main interest is in the horizontal rather than the vertical, if you like. To be an academic these days, you tend to have to choose a fairly narrow field and go deep into it, which has its value for sure. But I think the problem is, with everyone doing this and going deep, um, there's no reward in academic life for, for, for joining the dots. And I think that that's what's often most useful for people. So my way of working is to be a parasite upon those narrow, deep thinkers, and to then but to try and join the dots between them. So I will do some, some reading on uh, particular areas. And then I often do, always these days, I do some interviewing. So I go and talk to people and sort of like ask them the questions I want to ask them and try and partly to test whether when I'm making the connections I make, whether I'm getting them right. And then I also often try to do things which involve looking at some real life cases to see whether the application is. So when I was writing about personal identity, for example, you know, I, I spoke to someone who changed gender. I spoke to, I know uh, Identical Twins was the free will book actually, but another example of that. Um, I spoke to some uh, llamas who were supposedly reincarnated, you know, and things like things like to real people. So it's a combination of trying to get some kind of real life kind of grounding and experience, some, some book learning and some interviews with experts and then trying to join the dots in a way that allow the subject to, to make sense to people and to be applicable to them. And do you feel like you can get to a point, say, if you're studying sort of Eastern traditions of philosophy, um, say, and you're working how the world thinks, can you get to the point that you feel like you can understand the philosophies, even if you're coming from a point of like a Western individual uh, who well, hasn't been? Uh, well, no, uh, yes and no. I mean, I think that you've always got to, if you're going to be a, a broad thinker and writer like I am, you should never kid yourself that you've really sort of you know, understood everything. And in how the world thinks, absolutely not. I mean, I want to make it clear that I'm trying to get ways in. I'm trying to, I was trying to identify some of the key ideas which enable you to see the most important differences, the things that make the di these ways of thinking importantly different to our own in ways that we can learn from. So I absolutely don't think I've remotely cracked it and oh, now I understand it. But what I, I understand something which gives me some point of connection and some way in, and some way of using that as a, as a lens in which to look back at my own tradition. But obviously there's, there's always so much more to learn. And I, there are about a couple of people in the world who can genuinely claim to be experts on more than two traditions in philosophy. I'm, I'm not one of those two people. <laughs> and where is your work taking you next? 
Well, I mean, I, it, the strange thing about writing books is a bit like you know, filmmakers, they're being interviewed about their film going out in the cinemas and they're already working on the next one. Um, and so it's always a bit like that with, with books. I'm, I'm quite long into a book, which I don't want to say too much about because it's, uh, let's keep things intrigued. But let me just give you the premise of it, see, see what you think of it, which is that I, over the years, as someone who's been very interested in, in religion, although I'm an atheist, I'm always struck by this thing people say, which is that they say they don't believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God, but they think he was a, an important, good moral teacher. And really, the book I'm working on just asks the question, is that true? So was, if you take, if you don't, if you take Jesus Christ as not being Christ, just being Jesus of Nazareth, do we find in him a strong and compelling set of moral teachings, or actually not? I won't tell you the answer. You'll have to wait. Uh, and one final question. So we're at our Arts and Ideas Festival. I wondered if there's any um, films, artists, songs, song lyrics that particularly inspire your own philosophy or you just personally? Yeah, well, quite a lot actually. I, I, I often use uh, literature, music, film, in my books to illustrate things, because I think that the arts can, uh, you know, get us to attend to things in ways that I think are actually genuinely philosophical. Because I think philosophy in the Western tradition is often meant to be about argument, and argument's a big role. But I think all the best philosophy is also about the very, very careful attending. And I think there are lots of examples of that. Perhaps just to give one is that all the films of the Cohen brothers, I think, are fascinating. They're, they're very, very diverse. But I think in all those films, I think you see some very important, I'd say philosophical insight into, into ethics and morality actually, what it means to be a good person and what the difference is between a good person and a bad person. And I think if you look at a lot of Coen Brothers films, you, you, you get kind of three archetypes which keep recurring. There's the kind of, there's the complete sadist or the, the person who's completely outside or the moral domain, who just has got a moral bone in their body, the sort of embodiment of evil. But then you have the kind of like the, the pure in heart, if you like, who are actually often quite simple, straightforward people. They're not philosophers, but they're just good and decent. And then you have these people who are, who are corrupted by degrees. They're not evil, wicked people, and yet something, things happen, chain of events. They allow themselves to be corrupted and often do really bad things. And, you know, without sort of going into detail about and the, the films do this in, in different ways. So many of their films are in a way showing us, rather than arguing for us, um, important truths about what it means to be a good person in a world where there's so much temptation to do wrong. And one more. Um, you've spent a lot of philosophy and philosophers in your time. Um, if you had to go on holiday with any philosopher, alive or dead, who would you pick and where would you go? Oh, who would I pick and where would I go? Yeah, we'll okay. pay for the tickets. Okay, well, actually, because I, I, one of my most unusual projects to date is I've written a book about David Hume, but it, at the moment it's to be published in Korean and not in English. We hope it will be published in English. And, and part of the way that book was structured was we went on a journey with a philosopher. So I followed in the footsteps. And I, I did David Hume, and so David Hume seemed to me to be great company. I think he's a great philosopher. So I think I'd go for a tour of France and Paris with David Hume and see what he would think about what had changed between now and then. And we'd certainly have to get him to sort of reconsider some very uh, remarks he made about on, on race, which uh, have sort of stained his reputation I'm pretty sure he would be shamed and embarrassed by those and would recant in an instant because he was a philosopher who always responded to evidence. But it'd be, it'd be good to do that. So yeah, I'll go to France with Hume. More camembert for you as well. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you very much. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.